What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. By singing dog. <laughs> Bye, goal. I pronounce you. Bye, wedding ceremony. Stop. At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions. Welcome to Define You Radio. Class is in session with your host, the Southern Belle of Bold, Valencia Griffin Wallace. Are you ready to unapologetically build your confidence, achieve goals, and design a life worth living? Learn the life lessons and strategies to define your life, money, and business. Pins and papers ready. Class is now in session. Always have to let the beat play all the way out. <laughs> it's killer. It, that is a it killer is. Beat. <laughs> I have to let it play all the way out. Uh, welcome to Define You Radio. Classes in session. Uh, if you're a new listener, thank you so much. You are definitely in for a treat. Define You Radio is where you get the tips, strategies, and life lessons from queens who have defined their life. I'm your host. The Southern Belle of Bold Valencia Griffin Wallace Make sure you follow and connect with the show On Define You Radio's Facebook page For updates and more And all the information that guests give Will be posted there So in case you don't have a pen and paper ready The information will be posted there For you to contact guests that have been on the show Well you guys It is 46 days Until Define You Live In Houston, Texas Make sure you check out the website at www.defineulive.com and get your tickets while they last. VIP is almost sold out, I'm glad to say, but there are specials going on through September 30th, so you don't have much time. Don't wait. Good. What, what does it say? How does the saying go? Uh, good things come to those who wait, but only left by those who hustle or something of that nature. You you guys understand what I'm saying. You better get on it while it's hot. This is definitely an event you do not want to miss. Um, It's been a powerful month on Define You Radio. We've been discussing domestic violence all month, even last week sharing my experience, which, you know, I kind of got a little emotional. I don't know if you guys heard it in my throat. Definitely got angry because it made me relive the violation against my person, against mm-hmm. me. Um, so we're going to continue that. And tonight we have a very special guest. If you guys have been following, listening to the show You have heard her voice before. You know we have a very unique dynamic, so I'm fully expecting us to go over an hour. We shall see. Uh, (laughs) I have my my friend, my queen, Miss Precious Brown. And like I said, if you aren't a newbie, you know her voice. And if you are, you are in for a treat. Queen P, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be back. Hey, everybody, hope you guys are listening, or at least catch the replay. Yes, definitely. Well, Queen P, I know everything about you, so it's always kind of weird and hard for me to read your bio. (laughs) So why don't you go ahead and tell the audience about Queen Precious Brown? Ooh, um, where can I start? Okay, I am Precious Brown, as you said. I'm the founder of Kilgore Publishing, and um, Pen a Masterpiece, where I help women share their journey through the power of the pen, allowing them to define their own success, shift their mindset, and create the life they desire. desire. And I am a new grandma again. I'm super excited about number seven. Um, and I'm just loving life right now. 
That is me in a nutshell, on the grind, just like you. Yay, I love it, and congratulations on the new grandbaby. So are you adopting the the hot title right now of Glam Ma? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm a granny all day, every day. <laughs> I am not a Glam Ma. I am a granny, and all of them call me granny, and I just love it to life, I tell you. It lightens yeah. my day when I hear granny. <laughs> Yes, indeed. And then that way you could say, you know, when people say you look too young to be a grandmother, you know, that you could always say yes. You know, I don't know. Like if mm-hmm. if people say you look too young to be a glam but to each its own um, with that, I know I fully embraced calling my grandmother. Well, I called my grandmother mama and called my daddy mama grandma. Made it simple. There was no mm-hmm. extra special titles. Um, when my niece Valencia Jr. Happy birthday, Valencia Jr. If you are listening, um, when she had a son, and everybody was like, "Well, you're a great auntie," and I was like, "Yes, I am a great auntie," but I uh, refuse that title of great auntie. Like that sounds like <laughs> three generations up. So right. yeah, I just had to add that they're gonna have to come up with another title for that one. So um, it's been a heavy month. It's been a heavy I'm sure, month on the I'm show. Sure. I've been trying to listen in. I I watch the threads. I don't get to jump on because I'm in the middle of something. But I have definitely read the comments, so I know that it's been a doozy. And, you know, domestic violence, talking about it, always is. I don't think it'll ever be a light topic, especially right. for women. But it's so – on the first show, we actually had a guy – um, call in and he was saying how he was just getting out of a situation and I applaud him because a lot of times even though statistics tell us um, that men are victims too of domestic violence mm-hmm. that's not something mm-hmm. that men will talk about because we get like men handle it, but at the end of the day nobody wants to be hit right absolutely so, I what, agree I'm going to drop two statistics and then we'll get into your story. You guys know the past couple of shows I've been dropping alarming domestic violence statistics. So here we go. The number of women murdered every day by a current or a former male partner in the U S think about what you think that number is. Three, three every day. Now these, Every day. Now, this is um, these are some statistics, and I'm hoping I'm reading it right, guys. And if they're wrong, I will correct them because I just went and looked up some statistics real quick. So, because I actually think the number is higher than that, so dismiss that one. But this one, I do believe that women with disabilities are 40% more likely to experience intimate partner violence than women without Mm -hmm. disabilities. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with that I too. Agree. I agree. I agree. Most times when when there's a disability involved, there's lower self-esteem, not really understanding who you are and what you could bring to the table, even with the disability, regardless if it's mental, emotional, physical, whatever that disability is. So mm-hmm. I agree with that statistic. So Queen P, go mm-hmm. ahead and... Tell us about your story of domestic violence or your experience with domestic violence. Uh, Well, I have had several different instances in different parts of my life um, involved with domestic violence. I've shared before that as a young girl, I had an abusive boyfriend that was physically abusive. And I vowed after I got out of that, a man would never put his hands on me again. So I went from physical abuse to emotional and mental abuse, um, not understanding that they're one and the same. And, you know, to me, and this is just my own personal opinion, to me, the mental and emotional abuse is a hundred times worse than the physical. Because the physical, you, you get... You you know, you feel the hit, the sting right then, and it kind of wears off after time. 
where you have to deal with the emotional and mental abuse daily because you're you're rechecking yourself, you're rethinking what you're doing. Should I have said that? Does this look right? Is this, you know, so it's it's one and the same, but it's two totally different battles. So the abuse across the board is wrong, but coming from the physical abuse as a teenager made me more of the aggressor in the emotional and mental abuse. I wasn't the abuser in that manner, but I was one that I would throw a punch. I would throw something or hit hit him with something. So it doesn't go just I was the victim all the time. I think it was equally distributed between the two of us. So it 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 was crazy and then the in my marriage what brought us to a divorce is when he put a loaded gun to my chest and pulled the trigger. Now mind you, yes, that's devastating. However, out of that 17 years that we were together, um that was the one and only time he ever put his hands on me. And he so just let that sink in. Right. That Go ahead. statistic. What were you about to say? No, I was going to say that statistic uh, with three women every day, um, and I don't know. I think it's from 2011, so it is an older statistic, so to speak. But it comes from the American Psychology Association, and I, I quick, I click through quite a few things. Um, maybe it seems mm-hmm. like it's more. Because we hear about it so much, I'm I'm still gonna definitely do see if I could get some FBI statistics on that because it, it or more up to date statistics. That's the thing with statistics; they're only done every couple of years. But I would definitely say now, in 2017 mm-hmm. or 2016, I'm willing to say it's more than three a day. I'm sure it is in 2017. So do you think um okay so he put the gun he put the gun to you or he attempted to shoot you and the gun didn't go off No it jammed It jammed and we continued to fight until he kind of snapped out of the trance that he was in um you know I'm on the on the show we don't have time to go into the details of what happened but we struggled over the gun and as we were struggling he was able to point the the gun at my chest pull the trigger it jammed we continued to fight i got the gun away and the police uh came eventually but only after he snapped out of his trance and ran out of the house um it was surreal to say the least, because this is somebody that had never put their hands on me. Again, in this relationship, he did more of the emotional and mental abuse. I would be the one that pick up something and hit, you know, and he would just, you know, kind of block it or stop it or what have you. But that day was the end. And and it was the best thing for both of us, because one of the two of us wouldn't be here. Right. Definitely. Did your kids witness that situation? Because I know you had kids at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, my oldest son um, had come back to the house. My sister, in the progress of the fight, my sister had sent my children to their uncle's house. And my oldest son, he came back, and when I found out that he was there and witnessed it, he just stood there and looked at me and kept saying, I just had to come back to get my mama. I just had to come back Mm -hmm. to get my mama. So we have dealt with that emotional part because what we fail to realize as adults is when children are involved, they're going through it too. It's not just us. Yes, it may be us arguing and fighting, but their emotions, their well-being, their stability is involved as well. And they, they pick up those traits whether we want to believe it or not, abused children become abused adults. If they're mm-hmm. the, you know, they're the receiver, 
then nine times out of ten, when they get older, they're going to be the giver, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it was a challenge trying to keep them from from going down that road. Um, And it's still a challenge right now today. Mm. And three to men who were exposed to domestic violence as children are three to four times more likely to perpetrate domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there were some substance abuse things going on at that time in your life with you and your ex-husband. Do you think that was the trigger or do you think it would have went the way it went regardless? I don't think that it would have went the way that it went regardless um, if drugs and alcohol had not played a part. We were at the stage of the relationship where I was getting off drugs. I didn't want to do it anymore. And I knew I knew something had to change because the environment was the same. But I wasn't sure how to do it, how to go about it. This particular day, um, he was high. He was higher than I had ever seen him before. And if you've never stared in the face of a demon, it hmm. will paralyze you, okay? Because I knew it wasn't him. He had his eyes were black. He had he was foaming at the mouth, foaming at the nose. It was crazy, you know, and it's something that you hear or you may think about it being on a movie. But that's real life. Um, I think it was more so of a point of him realizing she's serious. She's hmm. not kidding anymore, and she is going to leave. She doesn't want to do the drugs anymore. And I think that reality set in, and I believe that that was a trigger. Black women experience intimate partner violence at at least 35% higher than white women. Your thoughts? Say it again. (laughs) Black women experience domestic violence 35% higher than white women. And that statistic comes from the University of Minnesota's Institute on Domestic Violence in the African-American community. Do you think that black women experience it more? I think black women report it more. Really? I think that we are, you know, because we have this whole independent thing and we got our girlfriends on fire. Girl, you ain't got to take that. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So we have those that are um, backing us to get out. Like, no, you don't have to take that. We, We can do this. We can do that. And we're, we're, we're prone, we're more prone to use the authorities when we have to. And we know Black and white women know when it's turning more dangerous than normal, if that makes sense. And I just believe that we report it more. I believe that it may be equal or it may be more in the white community. But, you know, their community, they do a lot of hush-hush. They want to keep it the, the front looking like it's, what it sh- is supposed to be by so- by society standards right. versus what it really is. So I think that it may be even or even more on their side. We just report it more. I know um, I didn't hesitate to call the police because even though, you know, emotionally I was beat down and physically, mentally, whatever, I knew if I ever had to hurt him, I needed a mm-hmm. police report to back me up. And that's just a hashtag real talk moment. It, you know, I knew Absolutely. if that if the day came that, and that's really where it was when I left, um, mm-hmm. that that day came that I, look, this is going to be your last time, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but the biggest thing for me was accepting that. Accepting, you know, nobody wants to say I'm a victim of domestic violence. Nobody wants to say that. And I don't think that we really say 
I don't think we rationalize it that way. It's just we got into a fight. You know, right. it's not, we don't label it as domestic violence until after the fact. Once, mm-hmm. once it's reported or once other people know about it or, you know, then the label comes. I don't think when we're in the thick of it, it seemed, because I never thought until we were apart, I didn't realize that I was being emotionally and mentally abused. Right. With the, the, the manipulation and the putting me down and the, you know, all the other tactics that abusers use to keep control. I don't think that, um, yeah, some, uh, Evelyn just said going at it. Yes, those are things, those are terms that we use, but the politically correct um, term being domestic violence, that just seems to us in our culture, for me, it seems like a weak term. Like you just letting him beat on you. And I knew that that right. was the case because I'm not, yeah, because I'm not, be, I'm not weak, so I'm right. not being domestically abused. That's not what's going on. We just got into it. We going yeah. at it. You know, we had words or whatever we want to label it as, but then it becomes public, and that's the term that's used. Mm. That's, yeah, that's a, especially... If you are a, I don't want to say strong woman because I do believe all women are strong, but as Absolutely. a, as a, uh, a fighter, a warrior, so to speak, um, when you mm-hmm. kind, when you kind of have that type of mentality, and you are you're fighting, you know. And I said on the mm-hmm. last show, mm-hmm. and I said before, you know, I looked, at, you know, me and him would go at it like two dudes in the street. Mm-hmm. And so for me to yep. accept that I was a "Quote unquote victim of domestic violence," I would ar- would have argued you down. No, because he got a right. black eye too, you know. Um, and and an- another part of that is we don't want to look at ourselves as victims. Yes, that word "victim" says weak, below standards. It says so much. So we don't want to say I'm a victim of anything, although that is how we feel. And we may have thought it ourselves, but we don't want anybody else to call us that. So, Mm -hmm. yes, we'll use any term we can not to say a a victim of domestic abuse. Even in um, doing the show, I was very mindful Mm -hmm. of my my wording. And I said, you know, sharing their experience of domestic violence or surviving domestic violence, which still kind of make me itch a little bit. But I just really do not like that term victim of domestic violence. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we really need to work on, and this is strictly my opinion on the way we word that, because I honestly believe that it's a hindrance in the healing. And mm-hmm. guys, you know, I would love to hear you guys' opinion or what do you guys think is a better way to say you know, someone that's experienced domestic violence versus using the word victim, because maybe if it was worded differently, it will be would be easier for women to say women or men, you know, and get help because they're not looking right. like a big uh, feeling like a victim because a victim, you know, it's nothing you could do about being a victim. It's helpless. So there has to be. Mm. Yeah, it's it's. It it has to be a better way to to say it that empower women to know you recognize this is what's going on you recognize it for what it is now let's get let's get out of the situation instead of a victim because I know mm-hmm. I was I'm not a victim I would have fought you you would have called me a victim I survived too right. much in my <laughs> life to be a victim you know and if you think mm-hmm. about it especially if you had a you survived a lot in life. So you're this strong, right. confident, queen P, extra, you know, everything. And then all of a sudden you're a victim. Right. Right. That's like, that's, Even more demoralizing than yeah. going through it is being labeled as. So I get it. I really do. So let's go go back to... When he when he came back into himself, 
Mm-hmm. What was next? After that, um, the police came, and when the officer stood in front of me and asked me, did I have somewhere to go, and I said yes, and he said, looked me square dead in my eyes, and he said, go and don't come back, or I'll be back to identify your body. Mm. That was the striking point. That was the striking point, and I knew then my 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 marriage and my life as I knew it was over. Um, I remember driving. My sister had the kids in one car, and I was in another car, and I had some of our clothes, and I'm driving, and she had already called our parents, so they called me. My mom and dad is Bonnie and Clyde, so he in the background like, get my pistol, we on our way, you know, <laughs> in the background, and she's saying, are you all right? We on our way, and I'm like, no, let me handle it. So my dad gets on the phone, and he's like, what's going on? And all I could say is my marriage is over. Mm. And it hit me like a ton of bricks because that was the one thing I never, one, expected, two, wanted, was for my marriage to be over. And part of that was because I was so comfortable in having the united front. Mm that united front that made it look like, because I have friends that tell me I never even knew all that was going on because of the united front. In front of people, no, you wouldn't know because we laugh, we talk, we have a good time, but behind closed doors, it was a different story. So in that instance, knowing that my marriage was over, that a shift took place on the inside of me. And it has been a process of changes ever since that moment. That was August 8th, 2008. I'll never forget that day. One of the things we've talked about on the show, um, and I particularly last show, about when you do leave is one of the mm-hmm. most dangerous points. You know, a lot of women and men have, you know, you deal mm-hmm. with the stalking, you know, you finally, you know, mm-hmm. decided to leave, you've left, then it's a whole other level of stuff. So did it you is. have to, it when is. you left, what are some of the things that you dealt with? When I left, I had to, um, I stayed with my sister for a few days. I think we may have stayed over there maybe a week. And then I was like, I need to go back to the house. Well, he wasn't coming to the house. I put all my children in one bedroom. I laid on the floor in the other bedroom. We had three bedrooms upstairs. One was empty. One had all the kids. I laid in the middle so I could see whatever was coming down the hall. And I slept with a shotgun because Mm. I was so angry that if you, if you come near me, I'm going, I'm going to kill you. That was my only thing. So then after that, um, I finally got an apartment. So the kids and I left the house. He went back to the house. And then I only had to deal with stalking that I knew of. Um, He made me aware that he was watching me. Um, One night at my apartment, and he said, if you come to your balcony, you can see, I see everything that's going on in your house because I have my blinds open. Mm. And so I got my shotgun and I stood at the at the at the door, at the sliding glass door, and I said, "Well, if you can see in here, you see what I have in my hand, and if you come up here, I'm gonna kill you." That's when the all that extra stopped because I think he felt like she's serious because at that point I was in mama bear mode because if you come to where I am now. You're really trying to kill me, and I need to not only protect me, but my children, too. So after that incident, we didn't, we didn't have any more problems. And crazy as it seems, as we started going through the divorce, we even went to family counseling because the children were so affected by everything that had happened. We went to family counseling together. Imagine that. So hmm. it... it it never got to the point of 
him hiding in the bushes, jumping out at me, you know, nothing like that. Was I on high alert? Absolutely, because I wasn't sure, you know, if there would be another over-the-top high night, so to speak. So I was on high alert, but it never happened. Mm. Now, was it something he tried to deny? Because one of the things with, you know, abusers, or you know, they are comfortable because they're covered and they could deny it and lie about it. Did he try to mm-hmm. lie about it or did he admit to what he did and y'all were able to move on from there? Or was it like, I don't know what she's talking about. Maybe she was the one high. Oh, absolutely. He denied right now to this day. Um, and the the biggest issue came when I released the first book, The Process of Change a look at me when I started going through my soul searching to figure out not only how did I get here, but how do I move forward? How do I change the the chaos that I've created? Um, because don't get it twisted. We both had a part in it, you know. Some of our stuff was equally crazy, you know, so I don't ever want it to seem like it was one-sided. Um, so when I started going through that process and I wrote that book, that's when the face to face denial came. You're lying. That never Mm -hmm. happened. Why would you say that? You know, those types of things. And right now to this day, and it's been, that was in 08 is 2017 and he still will not admit what happened that day. Mm. One of the things he did tell me is, um, I know you left me because I scared you. And I'm thinking, oh. no, you tried to kill me. You know, call it what it is. But he will he will not admit, you know, that that incident took place. Mm. Now, I know you said earlier that y'all would argue and sometimes you would hit him first. Do you consider mm-hmm. yourself to be an abuser? I did, yes. Mm-hmm. In in that in that relationship, I mean, because my my tongue is something. Um, it, it if I get to one hundred and one, all gloves come off. I'm hitting below the belt, under the belt, beside the belt, around the belt, all that. Um, so in that aspect, I would say that I was a domestic abuser as well. Um, because if he said the wrong thing too many times, I'm swinging. Now, mm. was it warranted? Did I feel it was? Absolutely. Was it right? Absolutely not, because I should never put my hands on him just like I didn't want him to put his hands on me. Okay. Thank you so for in this that. Go ahead. No, I was going to say thank you for your honesty and transparency. I don't know if you've ever been asked that question before. I know I've never asked you that question, but Mm-mm. I thought it was very, I've, I've a very never, interesting I've never, question. I've never been asked that question before, but I have definitely thought about it. Because mm-hmm. one thing, and, and I want all the listeners to know this, when you start to evaluate your life and the situations that you've been in or that you are going through, that you have gone through, Always be willing to acknowledge your wrong because everything is not everybody else's fault, you Mm. know. So in order for me to totally heal and for me to be totally authentic to precious, it doesn't have anything to do with him, the kids, or nothing else. Be totally authentic with precious. I had to say, you know, I caused some of those things. So, you know, my mouth can be, can get out of control. Back then, it did. Now I have a lot more control than what I used to have. Um, and it, I could see why, you know, he would say or do certain things after I've done or said certain things. So always be willing to deal with your own mess because we all have it. Whether we feel like the person that we're currently with 
is the cause of it or not, that's a different story. Where it came from, that's something you have to soul search and find out. But be willing to accept and take responsibility for your own part in every issue in your life. Mm. Great advice. Great advice. Because I know that's the last thing. Um, and, and some people may be truly innocent and, and do, you know, and you just with someone mm-hmm. that's truly crazy, so to speak. But like you said, mm-hmm. you know, I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't back down. And, and so I'm going to test you. Mm-hmm. You you come at me or say something sideways because me being who I am, I need I'm going to have the last word. Right, that's me. And <laughs> yeah, like I might have, and like you said, hit below the belt. If I if I'm vicious, I could hurt you more with mm-hmm. what I say. You know, especially in 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 an intimate partner relationship because you know more about that person than anybody. Mm-hmm. I'm pre- I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure, and God forgive me, but I'm pretty sure I've said something to exes that they gonna think about the rest of their life. You know, hashtag real talk moment. So, mm-hmm. you mentioned that you were in an abusive relationship before your marriage. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. How young were you, and what was that situation? And I'm glad to. I was just about to go back there too. Um, I was 15, and he was 20. Mm. And in that situation, it was manipulation. I didn't know anything about being physically abused. So when it happened, I was like, okay, wait a minute. Is this, oh, he must really love me. (laughs) And it sounds Mm. crazy now, being an adult and knowing better. But at 15, um getting money whenever I wanted, anything I asked for, you know, it was there on demand, so to speak. Um, my parents had forbade me to see this guy, so I was sneaking. So, right. And he knew it. So once the abuse started, it wasn't like I could go tell anybody because I'm not supposed to be seeing you anyway, you know. So now I'm going to be in double trouble, so to speak. So that relationship lasted from I want to say 10th grade to he, he ended up killing a classmate in the, of the, at the end of my 11th grade, mm-hmm, at the end of my 11th grade year. Um, and that is how I got away from him. Um, the abuse started after he knew my parents didn't want me to see him and I was sneaking to see him. That's mm. when the hitting start. It started with, he felt like I got smart or rolled my eyes or something, and it started with a slap. And then it was, oh, baby, I love you. I would never do that again, blah, blah, blah. You know the, the terms, the words that they use. And then when I finally broke up with him, he said, I'm going to kill myself. That's what made me come back. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I can't be responsible at, in my 15-year-old mind. I don't want to be responsible for somebody killing themselves. Okay, okay, I'll go back with you. How crazy is that? Mm. Um, so that went on back and forth, back and forth. And then one day, the last fight, I decided I was fighting back. You're not going to keep putting your hands on me. And this particular day, I had it was cold outside, and we had walked to the store, and I was a violent child. I, and walking to the store, I had had a pipe a piece of metal pipe in my sleeve um, because I called myself being a part of a gang. Um, and and I'm doing my air quotes like UV. <laughs> so we had come from the store, and we were all at a friend's house, and we were getting ready to play cards. And when he came in, he said, he asked me to come upstairs. He said that he, I was sitting on some guy's lap. I don't know if the couch looked like a man or I, I don't know. But when I tell you he slapped the cowboy taste out of my mouth. Wow. Taste went one way and spit with the other. And the next thing I dropped that pole out of my sleeve and I said, you, you're not going to hit me again. And we started fighting. That was the last time he put his hands on me. 
So, you know, I was very aware from that point on, no man is going to hit me. I knew that going into any relationship, if I thought you were going to hit me, it was over. So that is, that was my teacher, so to speak. But not dealing with it turned into me being aggressive, very aggressive in relationships. So, wow. Wow. And it, it's it's crazy how you said, like, it didn't start until he knew you were sneaking to see him, kind of almost like, yeah, I got you now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got you now. Yep. And and with, 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 um, with abusers, when they have that sense of I got you now, that first slap and you didn't tell nobody, that first jump on and you didn't tell nobody, that first black eye and you covered it up, as soon as they see that door open, Mm. it's going to continue. As soon as they see that you're going to cover for them, then it's it's fair game. It's it's wide open at that point because you just gave them the green light. Mm. So ladies, gentlemen, beware. Because, again, men do get abused. So beware of that sign. That first time that it's an accidental slap, that first time that, oh, it just flew out of my hand, I wasn't really throwing it at you, I kind of tossed it hard, that's a throw. Right. But the first time that happens and you stay or you don't tell or you don't do anything about it to change the situation, you allowed them to sweet talk their way back in. You just gave them the green light that it's okay. It's okay to treat you like that. And that's with physical, mental, or emotional abuse. You have to cherish you more than anything else in a relationship. And it's so. I will go back and, and, and quote that, guys, um, what Precious just said. with when you Basically, when you cover for them, you're giving them the green light. And I never, and I'm sure most of the audience never thought about it like that because we think that we're covering for us, you know, because I don't want anybody mm-hmm. to know I got this black eye or whatever. So I will go back and quote that. Or if you are on the Facebook page, please put that and tag Precious in. Because that, that is a definitely a quotable and thinkable thing. Because mm-hmm. that's one why other thing with that, a build up. Right. Absolutely. Because I remember the first time he hit me, he slapped me so hard, his handprint was in my face. Mm. And I went home, and you remember Noxzema? When you had bumps when you was a teenage girl, yeah, they and you would put make that it. on your face. Yeah, <laughs> I went home and put that on my face, and all mm. every day while I was at home until that bruise went away, I would just act like because I had acne right in the middle of my forehead, so I would just act like I was cleansing my face to keep my parents from seeing the handprint that was in my face. Hmm. Wow. You said a mouthful. Uh, So with that experience, so you had two domestic violence experiences, correct? Absolutely. And I had... The the third one was on, the third one was on its way, but I cut it off because I had already set my boundaries. I had already knew that I wasn't going through it anymore. I saw the signs. I saw the writing on the wall. Didn't nobody have to have on the flashing T-shirt. I saw it coming, and I said, "You know what? We're gonna end this right now because I'm not go- I'm not doing that. That was a deal breaker in the relationship. No lying, no cheating, and no violence of any kind. So I cut and that we, off. So I would say too. We we definitely have to have boundaries, but the reason why I asked you that because I know, and I'm sure you know, women that. Every relationship, four, five, six, however many, there there's domestic violence. Mhm, mhm. 
And yep. I've I've and seen people close to me deal with that. And I'm like, what? What? Why? It. And and one thing that I I think we downplay a lot because it's not it's not physical, mm-hmm. but the emotional and the mental abuse. Somebody downgrading you, telling you you're nothing, telling you that you you're not worth anything, telling calling you a bee, calling you a hoe, calling you anything outside of the name that was given to you. All of those things are signs. And because we don't look at it as he didn't put his hands on me or right. he didn't really mean it, he just mad. No, it's unacceptable. Just like you don't call him out of his name, he shouldn't call you out of or vice versa. You know, so we have to start looking at the abuse as a whole. It's not just physical. It's not just when your bones are aching and you see the bruises. It's also when you feel torn down, when you Mm. feel belittled, when you feel dehumanized, when you feel like you're, if he isn't lifting or she isn't lifting you up, then they're tearing you down. And that in itself is a form of abuse. So be mm. aware of that, ladies and gentlemen. Hashtag amen. It's it's very black black and white to me now. Um mm-hmm. because if I looked at, you know, relationships where there was no physical violence but just the emotional violence you know mm-hmm. that was a because it, it's it's almost accepted or no one really takes that seriously, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I would go as far back as remembering when my mom's husband, before she, you know, before she died. <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, calling me out my name, calling her out of her name. Um. Mm-hmm. But I never looked at that part as abuse when I looked at their relationship, but I knew something was coming. So I knew when mm-hmm. he started to, to, to call her out of her name and start verbally abusing her, I knew the physical was coming. So I had to be ready. And so being mm-hmm. that I kind of grew up with that, be ready, always be ready for a fight. You know, somebody voice get loud, like, even and I'm 40 now, so and even when I go out to eat, like I have to sit in certain places in restaurant because I mm-hmm. restaurant, you know, because mm-hmm. it's it's yeah. that be ready I, thing. And I totally and and it wasn't until the other day I had went out to to eat with my kids and their dad, the one who my ex husband. We had went out to eat. He came. My son just had the baby. Well, this is the day that the baby came. And it wasn't until I sat down and my son said, Mama, why do you always face the door? Mm. Because I never noticed that when I, when we in a public place, my back is always to the wall and I got to face the door. It was a mental thing. It wasn't something that I planned. I just wanted to be ready. Like you just said, I want to be ready in case something happens. I'm in a position to see it coming and or get away quick enough. Mm. So, you know, all of that is ingrained. And we don't we don't always think of, you know, why we do things or something, you know, or things like that. But when he said, why do you always do that? Because he was getting ready to sit where I sat. And mm-hmm. he's like, why do you always, you know, have to face the door and it was like I don't know but I did know I just didn't verbalize it right um so you know be co- be cognitive of your actions and and what you're doing and because really to me that was me holding on to I don't have any reason to be afraid of anything right now at this stage in my life but I still have that mentality of I have to be ready and a lot of times mm. when we keep that same mentality, although we're moving forward, we keep pieces of that mentality, it can stifle us. So be careful of that. And it makes you protective. Mm-hmm. And, and, and 
I would love to see the statistics on that because I think that it makes you, you know, more, you're more aware, number one, but you're more protective. And one of the things that I had to realize, you know, part of my healing, and that's what I definitely want to get into next, but, but uh, being a wife and even being in a relationship, you know, dating my husband, it was hard for mm-hmm. me to let go and allow myself to be protected because I was always right. the protector of my mm-hmm. mom, of my little sisters, of, of my son when, you know, when I was in the situation of, of me. So that was like one of the biggest things for me to allow myself to let somebody protect me. Mhm, mhm, and and I can relate to that. Um, growing up in being abused young, um, and then getting my parents got married. And when I say my parents, it's my bonus dad and my mom. Um, when they got married, the stability came, and I kind of talk about that in transition too. Um, at right around 10 when that shift happened and we became stable, but I had all, it had already been embedded in me to protect myself. So I grew hmm. up fighting. Even when I didn't have to, I grew up fighting um, because I was in protection mode. And I'm still in protection mode, not because I want to be or I have to be. That's just ingrained in me. Um, and that is a a prayer for me because I know that my husband is still out there. God created somebody just for me, but that piece of me has to die in order for him to Mm. be the man that God has called him to be in my life. You see what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. that is something I work on daily that, that having to feel like I have to protect everybody around me. And my children are grown, and I still feel that way. I'll hear something that happened with one of my kids, and instantly I go into, oh, no, this this is not going to happen. You know, but I have to, right, I have to allow them to go through their journey as well. I just (coughs) teach them from the sidelines. That's definitely a hard um, thing. And it's it's still a learning process, you know, um, being a wife. Because like I say, Mm -hmm. you know, all the time I've been married before, this is the first time that I've been a wife and allowing him to be the the husband because that's his job. That's his God-given role Mm -hmm. is to, you know, and so like if he calls me and, you know, he's not having a good day, this is, you know, breathe Valencia and then I'm like okay well who did you something do I need to come to your job you know that's like right <laughs> that's 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 me and um it's 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 the craziest thing but he is that way plus some um, you know with me and it's I'm still adjusting I'm still adjusting mm-hmm. and it's hard when you've been the protector your whole life and now you you get to be protected so mm-hmm. when we when we talk about healing, how did you heal or the talk a little bit about the healing process when you come out of a domestic violence situation or because I do believe you get a form of PTSD afterwards. Mhm. Mm-hmm. The healing part is the hardest part. Living through the abuse is hard, but the healing part is I would say is the hardest part. And I say that because having to, my process was starting with me. Okay, how did I get here? How can I change it? I knew I wanted something different. I didn't know what, and I didn't know how to get it. Start with that, starting with that process of, okay, these are the things about me that I don't like. Nothing to do with anybody else. These are the things about me that I don't like. And start start I started there. Because I knew for anybody to truly love me or like me, I had to like myself. I had to love me for who I was, the way that I was, flaws and all. Was I perfect? Am I perfect? Absolutely not. But I could be better. 
So I began to work on me, and in that healing process, I was able to find things that I didn't like. I identified things that that made me the way that I was, you know, instances that contributed to the behavior, the characteristics, the morals, the values, or lack thereof. Um, And just really doing that deep soul searching, not that surface stuff, saying, okay, well, my hair is, you know, I got weave on or I wear nails or this, that, and the other, not the surface stuff. I'm not talking surface looking. I'm talking about that real deep down in your gut, what is going on with me? Who is precious? And what does that entail? And it wasn't until I started lining up what I saw, which wasn't pretty, and what I wanted to see, mm. did, the, did any healing even begin. Because I had to address my own issues before I can even ad- address how somebody else had hurt me. Okay, because I can say, well, yes, he did hit me. Okay, well, how did I get to the point of allowing myself to be in that position to be with an abuser? And then I backtrack. Okay, I was abused here, and it was okay. I I didn't stand up for myself here, and, you know, I just went down the list to see where it went wrong, and then I decided what I would change. And that was my process, and that continues to be my process every day of my life since that time because I I still, every time, it's like an onion. Every time you peel back one layer, it's going to be something else there. So don't ever think that it, that healing is, oh, I'm done healing. No, no. no. You're not, you're not going to ever get done because every time you peel back one thing and you say, okay, this is what it was, this is how I can come through it, I'm good now. Something else will happen and it will trigger an emotion and you're trying to figure out how did I get here again. Peel back that nut flare and it will keep going. And eventually you will be to the point of wholeness to where you're okay with dealing with the outside influences on your life, if that makes sense. Definitely. And and a thought I just had or something I just thought about was, you know, if you've seen un unhealthiness and dysfunction and and abuse and been in abusive situations and that was the first thirty years of your life, you're not gonna heal mm-hmm. in six months. Absolutely not. And I I believe it's almost like, um, you know, when they call somebody a recovering addict and they say, you know, I have 10 years clean or 25 years clean or whatever else. It's a process. And I do believe when you have been traumatized and violated, Mm -hmm. it is a lifelong healing and 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 recovery. And you are more Mm -hmm. aware in, in some things, you know, when when a guy is talking loud to his girlfriend, I'm very aware of that. I'm like hyper aware of like paying attention, phone with nine one, waiting to press mm-hmm. the other one. Um and I don't Absolutely. know that it's ever gonna go away where somebody else may ignore it, which I think is part of the problem we ignore a lot. Someone that's mm-hmm. been there, it's it's a reflex. Like you you hear it. Mm-hmm. You know that ba- when that bass comes, like you you it makes you like how dogs, you know, you're your ears stand up. So, um, right. You know, that hour with us always goes by extremely fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it, it does. It's, it's so, um, yeah, that hour goes by so fast. Queen P. Yeah. I want to make sure the audience can, uh, get in touch with you. And I know particularly you have the, the process of change, which, if I'm not mistaken, is about that healing process. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure everyone can get in touch with you, check out the book, see what's going on, and be part of your world. How can they do that? Um, You can actually, I'm on all social media platforms as Precious S. Brown. Um, As far as the books, all of my books are listed 
on my website at penamasterpiece.com, P-E-N-A-M-A-S-T-E-R-P-I-E-C-E.com. Um, I am the host of the group um, Masterpiece Gallery, where I do help those that are there not only write their books, but define success in on their own terms, shift their mindset, and create the life they they desire by, you know, multiple tools and techniques that I share in the group. I also do live training there. Um, you can inbox me or I'm on Instagram, any social media platform. But I do want to say this to, to the audience. One thing about domestic violence is, yes, it is it's tough. And, and that's putting it mildly. It is very tough. But know that when you make up your mind that that is no longer the life you want to live, that's that mindset shift. You can still, no matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been in it, you can still come out and be the masterpiece that you were designed to be. So just know that. And everybody may not be, you may be in it, you may just be coming out of it, you may not even have realized before this call that you were going through it. But know mm. that you're, you are a masterpiece. And when you make that mindset shift, you will see the masterpiece come alive. And it's not going to be until you make up your mind that that's what you want to do and you don't want to live in that anymore. Hashtag amen. Hashtag amen. Queen P, once again, (laughs) once again, it was great to have you on. Of course, guys, you will periodically hear Queen P on the show because she has experience in so many areas of life and she's very transparent and real and you can always go on the define you radios facebook page or the website and find previous episodes that she was on it's always life-changing because everybody is not so transparent and authentic and i think that's part of the problem So I love that about you, you guys. Make sure you connect with Precious. Her information is on Define You Radio's Facebook page, and you could just click her name also on the radio's page, and it'll take you there. So with that being said, I hope you guys learned a lot and enjoyed this month. I know it was a heavy month, but thank you for sticking with us. It is definitely something that needs to be discussed, talked about, And, you know, we talk about cancer and cancer sucks and everything else, but domestic violence sucks as well. Hashtag that. (laughs) Hashtag Hashtag domestic violence sucks. Sucks as, yes, Yes. I'm going to hashtag that. I'm going to hashtag that when we get off the phone. (laughs) (laughs) With that being said, guys. It's been a a great show. Pens and papers down. Class is officially over. I do have domestic violence resources and phone numbers posted on the Facebook page also. Make sure you join us next week, same time, same place. Have a great week, and remember, only you can define you. Thanks for listening to Define You Radio. Class is in session. Connect with the show at www.defineuradio.com. Pins and papers down. Class is over. What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. By singing dog. Bye, goal. I pronounce you. Bye, wedding ceremony.
Stop. At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions. What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. Bye, singing dog. Bye, goal. I pronounce you... Bye, wedding ceremony. Stop. At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T-Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions.